When a child pieces together a puzzle, he isn't thinking about building a network. But that's exactly what he's doing. You see, a network is a set of components that link together and perform certain functions or services. In the telecommunications puzzle, there are many networks. Each one consists of many components that interconnect to exchange information. These components include telephones, computers, switching machines, and other devices that are linked together by wires, optical fibers, or radio waves. Most people think in terms of one large telecommunications network. In reality, there is an extremely large number of public and private telecommunications networks. These separate networks can link together because of connectivity. Connectivity is the ability of two networks to pass information between them with minimum delay or distortion. Basically, there are two groups of telecommunications networks, public networks and private networks. Let's begin with the public networks, which include the Public Switched Telephone Network, or PSTN, Common Channel Signaling System 7, or CCS7, the Public Packet Data Network, or PPDN, and the Cellular Mobile Network. Clearly, the Public Switched Telephone Network is the heart of telecommunications. It is a worldwide system of separately owned and operated networks that provides high-quality voice communications. The public switched telephone network also offers data services to its customers. In fact, the types of data services that are offered may soon outnumber the voice services. Public switch telephone service is provided primarily by two types of carriers. The local exchange carriers, or LEX, offer local service within a designated area called a local access and transport area, or LATA. When a call crosses the LATA boundary, it is handled by a long-distance company called an inter-exchange carrier, or IXC. Inter-exchange carriers are competitive companies that maintain their own separate networks. However, to provide universal coverage, they may lease trunks from each other. Traditionally, the public switched telephone network has been thought of as having two parts, a switched network and a dedicated network. These two networks are not totally separate. In a switched network, many customers share network facilities, such as the central office. Your phone at home is connected to the switched network. With a dedicated network, however, separate facilities and lines are used to establish exclusive connections between two locations. For example, the two offices of this company are connected by a dedicated network that is not shared by other customers of the public network. The many networks of the public switched telephone network communicate information over a separate internal network called the Common Channel Signaling System 7, or CCS7. CCS7 transmits signaling information over a high-speed channel that is separate from the inter-office trunks carrying voice signals. CCS7 is presently being implemented by the local exchange carriers and inter-exchange carriers. It improves the performance of their switching networks. When a call crosses a LATA boundary, the CCS7 systems of several local exchange carriers and inter-exchange carriers may have to communicate. Through CCS7, many new switched services can be offered, such as a consolidated database for 800 toll-free service. Another public network is the Public Packet Data Network, or PPDN. This network converts data into packet messages. The data packets are transmitted from the customer's data equipment, such as a computer terminal. The data packets are then switched by network facilities to their destination. Like the public switch telephone network, the public packet data network is actually a number of separate packet networks that can interconnect. There are both intralata and interlata packet networks. There is one type of public network, the cellular mobile networks, that are not generally considered to be a part of the public switched telephone network, even though they connect with it. The point at which calls pass between the LEX network and the cellular network is called the Mobile Switching Center, or MSC. Although there is little equipment commonality between the cellular network and the public switched telephone network, it is common for a local exchange carrier to also operate a cellular network. Along with public telecommunications networks, there are also private networks. Let's look at some of the private networks. 
Many larger companies operate their own networks to provide voice and data communications among their employees and even their customers. These networks go well beyond the PBXs that interconnect the lines in each company office. Private networks often consist of switching machines and transmission facilities that connect company offices, warehouses, and factories. Some private networks extend across the world. One type of private network that is rapidly growing is the local area network, or LAN. A local area network consists of a number of personal computers and shared peripheral equipment, such as printers. These components are connected with a high-speed digital link that ranges from 1 to 100 megabits per second. Usually, the elements of a local area network are physically close together, either in the same building or adjacent buildings. Separate local area networks can share data by connecting through the public switch telephone network. When two or more local area networks are linked within the local public network, it is called a metropolitan area network, or MAN. Local area networks can also be connected across LATA boundaries. This type of interconnection uses the network of an inter-exchange carrier and is called a wide area network, or WAN. Presently, a company's local area networks are connected by digital circuits that are leased from the local exchange carrier or inter-exchange carrier. This is referred to as a private MAN-WAN. In the near future, local area networks will be connected using a high-speed public packet network that is specifically designed for communications between local area networks. This network will be known as the Switched Multimegabit Data Service, or SMDS. In this introduction, you've heard the names of many telecommunications networks. Each one is separately operated to provide a specific service to its customers. When these separate networks link together, the customer receives a wide variety of voice and data services that seem to come from one efficient telecommunications network. Now please return to the computer so you can learn more about the telecommunications network. Today, the public switch telephone network provides a variety of services to many different locations, even a mobile telephone. During the next three programs, we'll look at the public switch telephone network as it operates today. Upcoming programs will describe some of the many services available to telephone subscribers. This segment describes the components of the Public Switch Telephone Network, or PSTN. Specifically, we'll look at the boundaries and carriers that currently make up the Public Telephone Network. As you learned in an earlier program, the Public Switch Telephone Network, or PSTN, is an integrated system of switching and transmission devices that can connect one telephone to almost any other telephone. The 1982 divestiture ruling created two types of common carriers. The local exchange carriers, or LECs, operate in specified local areas. The inter-exchange carriers, or IXEs, provide long-distance service. A local exchange carrier is the local telephone company that owns and operates the switching and transmission equipment within a specified geographic area. LECs are sometimes called telcos, Let's see how a local exchange carrier provides telephone service to its local customers. As you've already learned, 
The central office of each area is connected to each customer through a pair of wires called the local loop. Prior to divestiture, several central offices were usually located within a local calling area. Customers calling within this area paid a single set charge for telephone service. Calling areas are now divided into local access and transport areas, or ladders. There are now approximately 190 ladders throughout the United States. Most serve territories ranging from major metropolitan areas to entire states. One ladder may serve more than one area code. When a call is connected between customers within the same ladder, it is considered an intraladder or local call. The local exchange carrier performs all switching functions needed to complete intra-ladder calls. If the call is connected between remote exchanges, the caller may receive a local toll charge. When a customer requests a call to a line located in another ladder, the call is considered to be inter-ladder. Inter-ladder calls always involve toll charges. When the LEC recognizes that the requested call is inter-ladder, it must switch the call to one of the inter-exchange carriers, or IXCs. IXCs are competitive companies that provide switched service between ladders. Each IXC operates its own toll offices and trunks and charges the customer an additional fee for long-distance service. Whenever an inter-ladder call is requested, the local exchange carrier is obligated to provide a high-quality connection between the customer and the IXC of his choice. This concept is called equal access. Access between the local carrier and the IXC occurs at the point of presence, a facility located within the ladder that is operated by the IXC. The physical and electrical boundary between the local equipment and the point of presence is an interface called the demarcation point. If a direct connection is not available, the central office and the point of presence can be connected through an access tandem switch. From the point of presence, the interladder call is transmitted to a toll switching office that is operated by the IXC. As you learned previously, the routing decisions made in the toll network are based on dynamic non-hierarchical routing, or DNHR. DNHR changes routing patterns according to the traffic during any given time of day. This maximizes trunk use and minimizes network costs. Let's look at how DNHR operates. With DNHR, the hours of an average business day are divided into 10 time periods. Engineers estimate the amount of traffic during each time period between two toll offices. Toll offices that use DNHR are called nodes. The traffic estimates are then used to plan the most direct and least congested routes between two nodes during each time period. These planned routes are called engineered paths. When all of the engineered paths are occupied, a call can be completed over a planned alternate route called a real-time path. A real-time path is designed to link through only one intermediate node to keep transmission quality high and operating costs low. Let's see how DNHR is used to complete a call from Amy in Dallas to Bill in Phoenix. When Amy's local exchange carrier recognizes that the call is interlata, it accesses the point of presence of Amy's selected IXC. The interlata call is then switched to node one of the IXC toll network. Node 1 is now the originating toll switch, or OTS. In some circumstances, the OTS and the point of presence are located at the same facility. The originating toll switch retains control until the call is completed. In this case, Node 1 determines that the call must be routed to Node 4 in order to reach Bill's local exchange carrier. Node 4 is now considered the terminating toll switch, or TTS. Node 1 consults the routing table for the current time period. In this case, there are two engineered paths between nodes 1 and 4 during this time period, path number 1 to 4 and path number 1 to 2 to 4. The most direct path is selected first. In this case, 
That is engineered path number one to four. If this path is available, node one transmits the call to the terminating toll switch. If the first selected path is not available, the next engineered path, number one to two to four, is selected. On this path, node two serves as an intermediate node called a via toll switch, or VTS. To determine whether this path is available, node one sends a message to node two through the common channel signaling system seven, or CCS seven. As you learned in earlier lessons, CCS7 transmits signals between switching offices over a high-speed digital network that is separated from the inter-office trunks. If this path is also not available, Node 2 returns the busy information to the originating toll switch before the call is forwarded. This is called crankback. Crankback enables the originating toll switch to be quickly informed when an alternate route is required. If all of the engineered paths are unavailable, node one may use an alternate real-time path, such as path one to three to four. Before a real-time path can be used, a specified number of trunks in the trunk group must be free. This trunk reservation restriction ensures that calls routed along the real-time path will not block calls that normally use this trunk group. When the available path has been seized, the call is routed to the terminating toll switch. The call is then forwarded to the point of presence located in Bill's ladder, where the local carrier completes the call to Bill's line. Dynamic non-hierarchical routings flexibility enables a call to be quickly and efficiently switched between ladders and different carriers. This program has described the boundaries and carriers that make up the public telephone network. In the next program, we'll discuss some of the services provided by the common carriers. Before you view the next program, please return to your computer terminal so that you can learn more about the components of the public switch telephone network. In today's public switch telephone network, connecting a local telephone call is only one of the many services provided by common carriers. During this program, we'll describe some of these services which are divided into two main categories, switched and dedicated services. Switched service is provided through the regular shared lines of the PSTN. One familiar switched service is measured telephone service. With this service, the customer pays a basic rate for a specified number of local calls. A separate charge is paid for each long distance and local toll call. Many other switch services are available, such as direct distance dialing or DDD, which enables a customer to directly dial a long distance number without the assistance of an operator. Businesses and individual customers may also receive Centrex service, which provides PBX features directly from the central office. As you saw in a previous video, all Centrex extensions within a company are connected to the central office, not an on-site PBX. In recent years, the services provided by Centrex have expanded due to the growth of digital switching technology. This enhanced capability also enables Centrex customers to transmit data by accessing ISDN and local area networks. 
Centrex and other customers can receive a group of special features called Custom Local Area Signaling Services, or CLASS. CLASS features are provided by digital central offices through the Common Channel Signaling System 7, CCS 7, which sends signaling information over a high-speed separate channel. CLASS features include call forwarding to a predetermined location, as well as distinctive ringing, automatic recall of the last dial number, and many other features. Another switched service is the Wide Area Telephone Service, or WATS, which offers bulk toll rates for businesses that call many areas. With WATS, the customer pays a flat monthly charge and a per-call rate that is lower than the regular long distance. This billing option is called Outgoing WATS. Another option is Incoming WATS, such as toll-free 800 service. When an 800 number is dialed, the call is routed by the inter-exchange carrier of the business receiving the call. The watts charge is billed to the line receiving this call instead of the caller. Another switch service involves the 900 area code. When a 900 number is dialed, the caller's line is connected with the company's product, such as a pre-recorded message like the famous dial or whatever. The caller is charged separately for the 900 call. A percentage of that charge is paid to the business offering the service. Audiotex is a type of 900 service that enables personal computer users to access a centralized database by dialing a nationwide 900 number. Audiotex service is interactive and includes electronic mail and information exchange such as the latest rates or news bulletins. Switch service also includes operator services such as directory assistance and toll assistance for collect or person-to-person -person calls. Today, many operator services are automated such as credit card and pay telephone service. Pay telephones provide switch service to the general public, usually in areas of heavy traffic, such as airports. Two types of pay telephones are now used, coin-operated and credit card-operated. As you can see, there are many types of switched services. The other type of common carrier service is dedicated or private line service, which is provided by the same facilities as switch service, but through separate or dedicated lines. With today's digital electronic switching systems, the dedicated connections may not be actual hard-wired circuits, but stored information in the system software that establishes an exclusive link between two locations. One type of dedicated service involves tie lines. In this example, a company makes many calls between its offices in Boston and New York. For a single monthly charge, the company pays for the exclusive use of a tie line connection between the PBXs of each office. Another type of dedicated line is a foreign exchange, or FX line. The FX line connects a subscriber's premises with a central office outside of its local calling area. For example, this Boston company has paid for an FX line to a central office in New York. Boston employees can then make calls throughout the local calling area of the New York exchange at the local calling rates. Another benefit of the FX line is that customers in the New York area can call a local number at local rates to reach the Boston location. T1 service enable subscribers with heavy data traffic to multiplex up to 24 channels over one dedicated T1 line. The least T1 line transmits to the central office at a high speed of 1.54 megabits per second. Then, the T1 line can be linked to a host computer that demultiplexes and processes the data. Subscribers with smaller data transfer needs can receive fractional T1 service and lease only a number of channels on a T1 line. Dedicated services are often grouped according to whether they are analog or digital. Another consideration is the size of bandwidth needed to provide the service. 
Let's first look at the analog services. Narrow band services are transmitted over a bandwidth of under 200 hertz, which is narrower than that used for transmitting voice signals. Narrow band services include the low speed transmission of data at 300 bits per second or less. An example is a meter reading that is transmitted from one location to a remote control center. Voice band services are transmitted over the same 200 to 4,000 hertz bandwidth that is used for voice transmission. Voice band telephone facilities can also handle data transmitted at medium speeds, such as the transfers from a reservations terminal to a computer database. Another voice band service is facsimile or fax, which is transmitted over the 200 to 4,000 hertz bandwidth. Wideband services require transmission above 4,000 hertz. They include audio and television signals that are transmitted to specific locations. An example is the closed circuit television and radio channels provided to hotel customers. Digital offerings include broadband services, which transmit packet-switched voice, data, and video. Broadband data is sent over fiber optic cables at speeds greater than 45 megabits per second. Broadband's increased bandwidth allows for the transfer of high-speed data, high-resolution graphics, and video images. Because of its increased capacity, Broadband service can handle heavy data traffic and can interconnect with other networks such as local area networks and ISDN. Companies with high volume traffic between multiple locations may choose to subscribe to a virtual private network, or VPN. A VPN uses public switched facilities to provide a dedicated network for the individual subscriber. Because both public and private facilities are used, VPNs are sometimes called hybrid networks. Another term for a VPN is Software Defined Network, SDN. This is because software in the carrier centralized database stores the specifications that defines the individual subscriber's VPN. The subscriber accesses the VPN through dedicated lines, local switch lines, or remote locations via an 800 number. Calls are routed to a digital tandem switch, which queries the database for routing instructions. By programming the database, a VPN can be defined to the subscriber's specifications. Data may also be transmitted by Digital Data Service, or DDS. DDS is a dedicated digital network that transmits data between separately located computer terminals. It is most desirable when large volumes of data are frequently transmitted between fixed locations. The fastest DDS service transmits data at 56 kilobits per second. Data transmitted at speeds slower than 56 kilobits per second are considered sub-rate DDS services. Areas served by the DDS are divided into digital serving areas. Within each area, a dedicated line connects the subscriber's terminal to the local wire center, which is usually located in the central office. Data from the terminals of several subscribers may be multiplexed over a leased line and connected to the wire center. The wire center then connects the data signals to the DDS hub office. The hub office contains a multi-junction unit. This unit connects the multiplexed link to the end terminals or other wire centers. One multi-junction unit can handle up to three separate circuits called multi-point circuits. The digital data service has a very low error rate of less than 0.5%. DDS can be used for many applications, such as the bulk transfer and collection of data from remote locations, information and text retrieval, and facsimile transmission. During this program, We've described the wide variety of services that the public telephone network provides over both switched and dedicated lines. In the next program, we'll take a look at a third type of telecommunication service, the cellular mobile network.
Before you view the next videotape program, please return to your computer so you can learn more about the common carrier services of the public switch telephone network. As the original inventor of the telephone, this is an unbelievable sight. A telephone in an automobile. It's still hard to accept that they've managed to do away with the wires. Imagine, a person in an automobile can talk with anyone connected to the telephone system. Mobile telephone service is designed to communicate with any customer connected to the public telephone network. The cellular mobile network uses microwave frequencies from 825 to 890 megahertz. Mobile telephones offer full duplex transmission so that both people can talk at once. Mobile telephone service has been offered since the 1940s, although its availability in the first few decades was limited. In the late 1970s, however, the cellular mobile network was introduced. The cellular network brings the advantages of microprocessors and digital electronic switching to mobile telephone customers. Since the late 1980s, the use of cellular communications has been steadily increasing. The cellular network is divided into cellular geographic coverage areas, or CGCAs. In each CGCA, there are two carriers that provide cellular service. The wireline carrier is an affiliated subsidiary of the local public telephone company. The non-wireline carrier is a separate vendor that is not affiliated with the local telephone company. In one coverage area, 666 different channels are distributed among the cells. These channels are divided equally among the wireline and non-wireline carrier. Each coverage area is then divided into smaller sections called cells. The cell is the key concept of the cellular network. One cell can accommodate from 70 to 96 different channels. The hexagonal shape of the cell was chosen to provide the most effective transmission. At the center of each cell, a transceiver transmits omnidirectional signals in a roughly circular pattern. However, a circular design is not practical because gaps and overlaps would result between adjacent cells. The hexagonal shape encompasses the circular pattern of the cell signal while providing definite boundaries that enable the coverage areas to fit together in a honeycomb pattern. Now that you know the basic design of the cellular network, let's look at its other components. At the physical center of each cell is the transceiver, containing a low-powered transmitter that sends the omnidirectional signals to the edges of the cell. The transceiver also contains two receivers to receive information for the controller. A controller is a computerized unit that handles all cell site functions. The controller receives control data over one of the cell's channels. Control data may include a request for service from a mobile unit. The controller also sends control data, such as informing a mobile unit of an incoming call. The controller operates under directions from the Mobile Switching Center, or MSC. The Mobile Switching Center is connected to each controller by a four-wire telephone line or fiber optic cable. The Mobile Switching Center is a digital telephone office that processes control and diagnostic data from the controllers. The Mobile Switching Center controls the switching between mobile units. 
It also connects the cells to the local central office of the public telephone network. In a large coverage area, a mobile switching center may handle up to 100,000 mobile phones and over 220 cell sites. Customers are connected to the cellular network through their mobile telephone units. The control unit contains all of the user controls. The transceiver tunes into any designated channel. It is managed by a logic unit that interprets commands received from the network. Finally, the mobile coil antenna is usually installed on the trunk, roof, or rear windshield of the customer's car. There are also portable units, which are not hardwired into a vehicle and can be transported in a carrying case. However, portable units have a lower power output capacity than mobile units. Let's see how a call is connected from a mobile unit to a line connected to the public telephone network called a wireline party. The mobile subscriber first enters the digits of the wireline party in the unit's logic memory. When he presses the send key, the logic unit sends the digits to the controller of the cell. Along with the digits, the unit's identification number is also sent. Every unit has a unique ID number stored in its memory for billing and security purposes. The controller then sends the data from the unit to the mobile switching center, which determines whether the unit's ID number is valid. After interpreting the dial digits, the mobile switching center transfers the call to the local central office. The mobile switching center assigns an idle channel to the unit. Through the controller, the mobile unit is instructed to tune to the assigned channel. After verification that the unit is able to access the channel, the mobile switching center sends the audible call progress tone to the unit. When the call wireline party answers, the call progress tone is terminated and a talking connection is established. When a wireline party calls a mobile unit, the local central office routes the dialed digits to the mobile switching center. The digits are converted to the unit's ID number. The MSC then instructs the controllers of each cell to broadcast a paging signal for the called unit. When the unit receives the page, it sends an acknowledgement. All controllers that receive this acknowledgement send a page response to the MSC. The mobile switching center measures the page responses and determines which controller is receiving the strongest signal. Then, an idle channel is assigned to the unit and call processing continues. If there are no available channels for the unit, the subscriber receives a directed retry command informing the subscriber to redial the call in a nearby cell. The cellular network is able to increase the number of channels available to subscribers through capabilities called frequency agility, frequency reuse, and cell splitting. With frequency agility, a unit is not pre-assigned to a particular frequency. Therefore, the unit may be quickly assigned to any frequency that is available at the time of the call. If two cells in a coverage area are far enough apart, they may use the same channels without experiencing signal interference. This is called frequency reuse, which enables one coverage area to provide over 666 channels at one time. The cellular network has been designed to easily expand as the demand for mobile telephone service increases. When traffic within one cell exceeds its capacity, its boundaries may be revised to create several smaller cells within that area. This process is called cell splitting. A separate controller and transceiver are relocated at the center of each split cell. Each new cell is also assigned new channels. Through cell splitting, the number of channels available within this coverage area has increased so that more calls can be handled at once. A mobile unit is able to travel between different cells and coverage areas without significant loss of signal quality. This is because of the capabilities called handoff and roaming. Handoff enables a mobile unit to travel between cells as a user travels toward the perimeter of its serving cell, 
the signal strength of the call begins to weaken. When the signal has fallen below a predetermined level, the mobile switching center locates the cell currently receiving the strongest signal from the unit. It then converts the call to a channel that is available within the new cell. Handoff occurs when the call is transferred to the new cell's transceiver without a loss in signal quality. Mobile units are also able to receive service outside of its subscribed coverage area because of the capability of roaming. The call from the roaming unit is passed to an adjacent service provider called a roaming provider which handles the call as it proceeds through its area. As the unit reaches the perimeters of the area, the roaming provider transfers the call to an adjacent system. A subscriber traveling from Washington DC to New York City may roam through the coverage areas of three different service providers. However, if the unit roams through an area not covered by the cellular network, service cannot be provided. With the continued growth of the cellular network, it may eventually be possible to receive continuous telephone service while driving from coast to coast. The cellular network may also be used to transmit data communications. However, during the fraction of a second required for handoff, data signals can be disrupted. Supplemental devices that provide error correction and retransmission of interrupted data are necessary to compensate for handoff. As technological developments continue, reliable data transmission over the cellular network should be possible in the near future. Telephones and automobiles. I never considered the possibility when I first worked on the telephone, and now they're perfecting it so computers in the car can also use the network. I can hardly wait to see what they come up with next. Now please return to your computer so that you can learn more about the cellular mobile network and complete this lesson on the public switched telephone network. As we discussed in other programs, the public switch telephone network is used to exchange both voice and data communications. However, an increasing number of subscribers are exchanging data communications via the public packet data networks, also called simply the packet networks. The packet networks were developed during the late 1970s. Their purpose was to switch data between subscribers' terminals as easily as the conversations carried by the public telephone network. You may remember that long-distance telephone service is provided by several inter-exchange carriers or IXCs. Similarly, packet switching service is provided by separate packet networks or vendors, such as Acunet and Telenet. Both circuit switching and packet switching are used for data transmission. Let's compare how packet switching differs from circuit switching. With circuit switching, a physical circuit transmits the data signals between the sender's terminal and the receiver's terminal. One physical circuit is established for each connection. 
In order to switch three calls, three separate circuits are required. With packet switching, the data message is converted into blocks called packets. Each data packet is transmitted along links that are shared by several calls. The links connect the packet switching offices, which are called nodes. With circuit switching, the physical circuit is dedicated to one connection throughout the call, even during periods of silence. This can result in a waste of resources. In comparison, a packet call is sent along a virtual circuit. A virtual circuit is a temporary path between the sender and receiver that is stored in the node's memory. A link along the virtual circuit is only in physical use when data is being transmitted. Along this virtual circuit, only the link between nodes 2 and 3 is being used for the call. There are several protocols that are used by the packet networks. They enable different devices and packet networks to communicate with each other. Protocol X.25 has been recommended as the standard format for transmitting data between the packet network and a subscriber's terminal, which is called the Data Terminal Equipment, or DTE. The device on the network side, such as the node, is called the Data Communications Equipment, or DCE. X.25 describes three functional layers of protocol. These layers are consistent with the Open Systems Interconnection Protocol layers that were discussed in a previous program. The X.25 layers include layer one, the physical layer, which defines the physical interfaces between the DTE and the DCE. Layer two, the data link layer, defines how a link is set up between the DTE and the DCE. Layer three, the network layer, defines how the packets are connected through the network from the sender to the receiver. Data from a subscriber's DTE is converted into packets by a packet assembler, disassembler, or pad. The pad may be located in a subscriber's DTE, such as a computer terminal or telephone. The pad can also be in a central location, such as the nearest node. In front of every packet, a packet header identifies the individual packet and its position within the data message. Before the packet can be transmitted to the network node, it must be formatted into a frame. The frame consists of additional fields that enable the node to correctly identify and route the packet. Packet assembly and disassembly allow computers and other devices to communicate using the appropriate protocol. This is done by converting the originating machine's data to the receiving machine's protocol. This process is called protocol conversion. For example, the pad assembles asynchronous binary data from this ASCII terminal into packets that are compatible with X.25. The packets can then be transmitted to the network node. At the destination, the pad disassembles the X.25 packets into a form that is compatible with the receiving DTE. In this case, the packets are disassembled back into the asynchronous binary ASCII characters. Packet switched calls from many DTEs can share the same link. This is possible because each call is assigned a different logical channel number, or LCN. Now, for example, the West Branch DTE of a company is originating a call to the downtown office. The pad of the West Branch DTE assigns an LCN to the requested call. Because the West Branch DTE is sending, it is assigned the highest available LCN value. In this case, let's say that the LCN is 104. The node stores the packet's identification and routing information and associates it with the LCN. Before the node can send the packet to the downtown DTE, it must associate the information with a different LCN. Because the downtown DTE is receiving, it utilizes the lowest LCN value. In this case, the LCN is 3. Once the nodes have memorized the address and routing information, subsequent packets use the LCN. The node will route the packets to their proper destination. Packet calls switched between nodes of the same network are called intranetwork calls. Packet calls can also be switched between nodes of different networks. These calls are called internetwork calls. When the primary path between two nodes becomes congested or blocked, 
dynamic routing enables the packet network to automatically reroute the call to a secondary path. Every packet of a message contains the destination address. Because of this, a node can send the packets along separate links if necessary. All of the packets will be routed to the correct destination. This type of routing helps to increase transmission speed and avoid blocked calls. Along with dynamic routing, the packet networks also perform sophisticated error detection schemes. At every node, lost or damaged packets are detected and corrected. This results in data transmission that is virtually error-free. For the near future, there are plans for a packetized voice network and further advancements in packet switching technology. With help from these developments, the packet networks will continue to exchange data between two terminals as easily as a conversation between two telephones. Now please return to the computer so that you can learn more about the public packet data networks.